Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the staggering temple at Abu Simbel. We are about as far south as we could possibly be in Egypt. We're only a few miles from the Sudanese border and we've come all this way down to marvel at this absolute masterpiece. The construction of this was ordered by one of the most celebrated leaders of Egypt of all time, Ramses II. He's the chap that we can see four copies of, well, three and a half copies of, on the front of it, um, after he won an incredibly important battle against the Hittites in 1274 BC. The battle that he won was called the Battle of Kadesh and ended up building this 30 metre tall, 35 metre long structure, 100 feet by 115 feet, to uh, commemorate the victory. Once again, we just have incredible detail everywhere. These little statues for the record, um, family members of Ramsey II. And he's just, he's just a pretty big chap, isn't he? Before we go in and have a look around, there's just some really minor details I wanna point out on the outside. So I'm not sure if it's gonna pick up very well, but you can see lots of really, really faint lines, like cuts of all the stone and how it was put together. I really don't know if this is going to show up at all, but they've got really faint lines on the sides just in front of their ears. But also, hopefully you can see that, little cuts across the chest. That's actually not to do with how they would have built this, that's to do with how we relocated it. It hasn't always been here. In 1964, UNESCO organised the moving of this entire structure bit by bit and moved it away from the Nile because it was rising too much and it put the whole thing at risk. The reason for the rising level of the Nile is because of what we discussed in yesterday's video when we were in Aswan about the dam. The dam obviously leveled everything out downstream and stopped the flooding, but it meant that the level before the dam rose and that's why the Nubian people had to move. Anyway, and that's why this was at risk because this was originally along the shores of the Nile, but obviously having unearthed such a gem did not want to risk it just disappearing again forever. Construction would have taken about 30 years to complete on this and it isn't just these three and a half chaps across the front there's a whole temple inside this um this is just absolutely astonishing though isn't it other key facts about this it was uh, actually discovered in 1818 after centuries and centuries of being buried in the sand it was buried up to about 10 meters so only really the top half of this would have been showing and it's named abu simbel after the kid that showed the explorer where it was so the kid was called simbel that's why it's called that I'm not really sure what the photo or video taking policy is inside. I know they're trying to keep it extremely pristine and they don't want camera flashes making it fade or anything indoors. I don't really know what it looks like. That's why we're going to go and have a look in a sec. But um, I'll film what I can for you, chaps. All right, so it seems like picture taking and video filming is fair game in here. So. Uh, yeah, all these walls are just covered in inscriptions, writing and pictures of that famous battle that he won. And uh, <laughs> that guy's not having a good time, is he? It's just that detailed and well kept that it feels like it just can't really be real. Like I was saying in, uh, in Luxor. I'm in one of these little side chamber things. And yeah, just the further you go, the more and more there is to admire about this place. Not entirely sure what all these engravings are supposed to depict. It looks a little bit like he's trying to offer Jaeger bombs and cocktails to his pal, but I don't I don't think that's it. Looks to me like offerings to all the different gods that this is built in honour of. And uh, yeah, there's plenty of them. I think this might be part of my man's head. That's how big these blocks are though. Even some of the paint on the massive statue's faces are still intact and that's madness. It's been three and a half thousand years. Let's also not overlook the fact that as you walk outside you've got the massive and wonderful Lake Nasser in front of you. One of the most remarkable things about this temple though is precisely how it was built. So firstly it's worth mentioning that it's not only a temple just for uh, marking the victory of that battle uh, by Ramses II, it's also built to honour a number of gods like Hamon Ra, Ra Harakt and Ptah. That's important because of the way sunlight enters this temple on two specific days of the year. Alright so this is quite a difficult thing to capture while I was inside, there's a lot of tourists here and rightly so, 
um, but it was difficult to get this view. So here's the four gods that are depicted, one of them being the god of darkness, Ptah, right at the back of the temple. So on the 22nd of February and the 22nd of October, they're the dates of planting and flooding of the Nile and also of the birth and the coronation of Ramses II, so they're pretty special days. Now on those two dates, specifically those two dates, sun shines through the temple through the front door, which isn't very big, goes all the way through to the back of the temple and shines on the four statues at the back. One of those statues is the God of Darkness, Ptah. Now when it happens, deliberately, the God of Darkness is left in the dark. That's how impeccably measured that was. And we've got no idea how they managed to do that. Um, I'm not even sure if we could do it now. Maybe we could with all of our technology and everything, but three and a half thousand years ago, that's quite a feat. So there's Ramses II temple, and just over here is a second one that he built for his bird. Obviously, a chap of Ramsey's stature has more than one bird, but his favourite wife, his first one, Nefertari, had this one built in her honour. At the front of it, you've got a couple of statues of Nefertari, as well as a couple of statues of Ramsey II. Shock, the man does quite like a statue of himself. And this one is a bit smaller than the, uh, the main one, but it's still, still mighty impressive. Inside this one, his wife's temple, Queen Nefertari. Uh, there's just lots of uh, drawings of love and protection and all that kind of stuff. Here he is protecting his queen with a bow and arrow. You don't get much more uh, affectionate than that. This smaller temple is not only built in his wife's name, but also in the name of the goddess of love and fertility, Hathor. And there's a few drawings and statues inside and some really unflattering pictures of his bird. Interesting to see how he depicted himself in his own temple, big mighty statues, compared to uh, how he represents his wife. Little squashed engravings on the wall. But you know, he did build her a whole temple, so there's that. And that is quite a big deal in these parts. Obviously, everyone around here had multiple wives. It's pretty mad to pick one that is your favourite one and then build her something as extravagant as this. So yeah, I think he might have been a little bit fond of Nefertari. In the enormous job of relocating this temple, it was moved 200 meters up from where it was just so it doesn't sink. And in 1964, it cost $42 million to do so, which in today's money is nearly half a billion dollars to move all this. And they do reckon that um, the way they reconstructed this was at least as sturdy as the way it was done originally. And they think that even if a 10 Richter scale, whatever it's called, a big earthquake hit it, it would actually survive it completely. So they reckon they've done a pretty good job, but I suppose for half a billion dollars, You've got to think that, haven't you? Isn't all this just absolutely astonishing? And in addition to that point about the unique days of the year on which the sun does actually go through and shine on those statues specifically as they were intended to do, today, the day that I am filming this, is actually February the 22nd. So it is on one of those incredibly special days. I know that wasn't planned. I didn't actually know about that date, specifically being that date, and it was in February sometime. I didn't know about that until yesterday. So yeah, here I am, at the temple, on the day in which it was ever intended to be viewed. It's not bad luck, that is it? Most of the inside of this temple are just absolutely impeccable. And I, I don't want to apologise for making too fine a point of this, because there's no way I can overstate how incredibly well kept they are. But there's just so much detail in all of it, in every inch of it. It just keeps on going and going, it's fascinating. And I think, chaps, that is about that for Abu Simbel. Absolutely worth the few hundred mile trek south. We've now got an awfully long way to go up to Cairo. One thing I am grateful for in all this, visiting Abu Simbel, is that, uh, you know that chap that broke the obelisk? <laughs> oh, poor guy. The guy that got sacked for breaking the world's biggest ever attempt at an obelisk. Well, I'm glad he went around in 1964 to try and relocate these bad boys, because, uh, well, they would have crumpled. But yeah, absolutely buzzing it's still standing. Buzzing that it's not going to get washed away by the Nile. And also buzzing that the plan so far is working quite swimmingly. About to get the bus back to Aswan, and then we're going to fly domestically from Aswan to Cairo. Save ourselves about nine days of buses. So something like 800 miles to cover this afternoon, maybe 700. A good stint anyway. And, um, yeah, that's Abu Simbel, southernmost point in Egypt. Onwards to Cairo.
And just like that, I've been booted out of Aswan Airport, uh, which saves me a good hour and a half, actually, compared with going back to the city and then back here again. It's a bit out of the way. And uh, yeah, it's all going a little bit well, this. A few bits have been delayed or just not shown up at all, and we've still managed to have a good go at everything. So um, yeah, pretty satisfied so far with, uh, with the overall plan. Getting around quite nicely. So yeah, a domestic flight to add to our list of transport methods getting around Egypt. And on top of that, also saves us an entire day just sat on a bus, which is good in terms of efficiency. So uh, let's have it. Cairo is absolute madness. All right, so just about survived getting to a hotel. I mean, it's a very, uh, very interesting hotel room, but you know, it does the job. A mad little thing worth showing you, I think, in terms of the 22nd of February thing, is that not only is it Tuesday, second day of the week, 22nd of Feb, 2022, but the seat I was put on the plane was also 22B. B also the second letter of the alphabet. Um, it's been a bit of a weird one. The city is absolutely manic. It took forever to get from the airport to here, and so touristing is postponed until tomorrow. But we have a full day here tomorrow, and there's plenty to be seeing in Cairo. So, um, brilliant day at Abu Simbel. A lot of travelling about, a lot of miles covered. Now I'm going to bed, and we'll uh, explore in the morning. Cheers, boys, in a bit.